Um, next speaker is uh, Hamid. Actually, surprisingly, we are working together already like one and a half year, and I still don't remember the surname of Hamid. Sorry, Hamid. No, I, I, I can read it, but I can be wrong. So, Hamid? Hamzi. So, uh, Hamid uh, uh, had a, a master, uh, sorry, had a bachelor in uh, Izmir Institute of Technology, and uh, uh, next he moved to Bosphorus University for the, for the master. And after this, uh, and before joining to our group, he was uh, working uh, in the company Genomies. Uh, it's like cloud-based uh, genomics. And now he's working in our group and uh, doing actually super exciting work. I'm a bit jealous. Uh, so uh, he is uh, working on the metabolomics uh, and like uh, uh, working with metabolomics data in a uh, MaxQuan. So, but uh, this talk is going to be uh, about Max LFQ and what's going on under the hood of this uh, algorithm, which sometimes is crashing, but most of the time is working. So, please, Hamid. So, uh, hello everyone, and thank you, Pavel, for the very nice uh, introduction. I hope you've been uh, enjoying the summer school thus far, and now you're looking forward to um, getting to know a little bit more about uh, what goes on under the hood in uh, the label-free side of MaxQuant. I'd like to start off uh, by talking about uh, the different dimensions of protein quantification that we can do. So, in, uh, essentially, after you do your experiment, you end up with such a table where you have your samples in the columns and your proteins uh, in, the, in the rows. And we can do two types of um, quantification here. Uh, one is called relative quantification and one is called absolute quantification. And what relative quantification is, is basically quantifying proteins across a sample. So in this uh, example, we are quantifying protein 2 across five different samples, S1 to S5. And absolute quantification, where we compare proteins within a sample. So for example, uh, protein, uh, sample, in sample 3, we are trying to quantify proteins 1 to 5. And for each of this, uh, the, our software suits have uh, some solutions. So LF, max LFQ is for relative quantification, and it's within uh, max quant. And protomic ruler is for absolute quantification, and it is within the Perseus software package. So um, I will start off with uh, relative quantification. And uh, just before we go into the details of Max LFQ, just a reminder from both Dan and Jürgen's talk, um, there are different kinds of ways of doing uh, relative quantification. Uh, you can do it uh, label-free, MS1 labeling, or MS2 labeling. And just to remind you about some of the properties of uh, label-free and what makes it special, I'm just going to summarize some stuff here. So first and foremost, uh, you have minimal uh, sample prep. Uh, but the problem is that you do them in parallel, and you have to have uh, some sort of uh, normalization, and you have to take care of these biases that might come out of uh, parallel sample handling. So that is why uh, label-free quantification is computationally expensive. You have to take care of a lot of things. But you get a higher uh, dynamic range. Um, but you're more versatile because you're not bound to these heavy isotope labels. Uh, you, have, you essentially have no limit on the uh, sample uh, numbers because, again, you're not bound to labels. And just to remind you that in uh, label-free quantification, we are trying to compare identical peptides. So unlike uh, MS1 labeling and MS2 labeling where uh, the peptides are uh, equivalent, uh, and they are a little bit different, and there's a mass shift. In uh, LFQ, we uh, essentially have to find the exact same thing, and then we have to compare them together. So, Max LFQ, um, this is the publication for Max LFQ. So, if you use Max LFQ, this is the publication you should cite. And if you want to read it and get a, a better idea or remind yourself of some of the concepts that I talk about, this is where you should look. Uh, it's already had about 1,000 citations, and the citations are steadily growing. It shows that the community is adapting this uh, algorithm pretty well. 
Um, so that's the publication to go to. Uh, now I'd just like to remind you all of the challenges that we face uh, with uh, label-free quantification. So the first one is the retention time difference. Since we don't have any labels, and since we, have, we can't mix all our samples and put them into one run, uh, there will be uh, some retention time differences uh, between our runs. So we have to correct for this. Uh, we have the problem of sco uh, stochastic MSMS sequencing. So always the machine is choosing the most abundant peptides for sequencing, and sometimes you may end up with missing uh, peptides across samples, so we have to take care of that. And we have this prefractionation problem, and that is uh, when you have uh, the same peptide occurring in different fractions, and you have to somehow normalize for the intensity of these peptides across these uh, fractions. Uh, I'll start off with the retention time problem. Jürgen also just talked about it, but I also I'm going to emphasize some points here. So it's the same slide. Uh, you can uh, quickly see that here we have some kind of trend going on, and we have dense and less dense areas, uh, which can be used for FDR calculation. And what we basically do is we calculate a, um, a function which can be used to predict where your uh, peptide will occur in a sample compared to another one. And just a small note on um, the point that how different these samples could be. Could be. Um, even if you have like a time series data and you have sample 1 to sample 10, let's say, and sample 1 is completely different from sample 10, it's okay if, if there's a gradient in the difference because what the algorithm does is it is clustering uh, the, uh, the runs first and it's actually doing the retention time alignment for the most similar runs and uh, in this way you can uh, avoid having problems. But um, what essentially happens if you, is if you can do this uh, retention time alignment uh, properly, and then you have uh, a, a, you plot the retention time of the peptides for one sample across the another sample. You just get this nice straight line, and even if you have very many samples, you can uh, still plot them all, and you can see that there is this very nice um, trend going on. So it's working pretty well, and, and this problem can be solved in this manner. The second problem I told you about was the stochastic MSMS sequencing. And what, is, uh, what we do here is after the retention time has been aligned between run one and run two, uh, if we have an identification within one run uh, for an isotope cluster here, um, then we can just, and we, and we can find the same thing in the second run, then we can just uh, transfer the identification from run one to run two. And in this way, we can, uh, uh, just as Jürgen said, we can even increase the identification rate by even 100%. So this is how we deal with that. The, second, uh, the third problem is the prefractionation problem. And um, this is how we take care of that. Let's say we have uh, four samples, A to D, and we have 16 fractions for these samples, right? And we, here I am showing two peptides. One is in orange, the other one is in green. And what uh, we see is the size of the circle uh, depicts the amount, the intensity of the peptide within each fraction. So you see that there's, uh, for in sample A, we have peptide P in three fractions, but in sample B, we have it in four fractions. And um, to deal with this problem, uh, let's say we have sample P here. And what we do is we take uh, the intensity of sample P in uh, uh, peptide P in sample A, uh, and we uh, write um, an equation like this uh, for it, where n is the normalization factor, which will be the calculated later on. I will explain that, and will be the normalization factor for this run, uh, and then. Um, XIC is the extracted ion current for peptide P in fraction 6 plus fraction 7 plus fraction uh, 8, right? And then we do this for every peptide in every fraction. And then we end up uh, with these, uh, with these um, equations here. And then what we uh, do then 
is uh, calculate the sum of squared logarithmic differences for peptide P uh, in, uh, in different samples, and we sum these up, and considering the fact that we expect the majority of proteins across all samples to not change, we can minimize this, uh, this term here to come up with a normalization factor for each, uh, each run. Now what happens is if you have many, many runs, these equations uh, kind of grow and they become computationally very expensive. Uh, so to deal with this, uh, what we do is we take a subset of uh, these, uh, these uh, calculations, uh, heuristically, and we only do a subset of them. And this is called fast LFQ, which you can turn on and off within the software. Now, if your uh, samples are very different from each other, this, will, this is what will happen. So you will get an error. Uh, and if you read the error, it says there are problems with normalizing file, and then it gives you the file names, right? So this is not a bug. Uh, this is a problem with your samples or your experimental setup. So you have to think about how you're going to uh, run your samples within the software. Um, so let's move on to uh, relative protein quantification and how that works uh, within the algorithm. So let's say we have a protein with seven different peptides uh, defined for it. And then um, here you can see that we have samples A to F and we have the peptides here. So sample A has two peptides identified, sample B has three, and so on. And there is a setting within the software called LFQ minimum ratio count. And uh, this is, I think, default set to two. Uh, you can change this, and what this means is uh, the minimum number of peptides needed to occur in two samples to be able to compare them together. So if it's two for sample A and B, uh, it's like this. So you need these two uh, peptides to be able to do that. And uh, if you take the whole matrix, uh, matrix and then... Um, so look at every single sample which, has, uh, which shares at least two uh, peptides, then you end up with uh, this, where you have uh, green and red uh, values there, with the red ones being the samples which cannot be compared because th uh, they only, for example, in the case of F and E, have only one uh, sharing peptide. And then... Uh, the algorithm solves these, uh, these uh, intensity-based uh, equations uh, with this formula, and then we can come up with this kind of uh, quantification profile where for this protein, we can, we can have a look and see the intensity relative to each uh, of the uh, samples. Now, F uh, here is at zero, and this doesn't mean that F is not... Uh, present in the sample, it of course is because we have two peptides for it. It just means that because we set the LFQ minimum ratio count to two, uh, there's just not enough data for the algorithm to come up with a value for F. Um, but there is one more thing that uh, max LFQ can do, and that is called um, stabilized ri large ratios. And that, that happens, that only takes action when uh, there is such a scenario where you have many peptides from the same protein in a sample, but only a few in the, in the other one. And this is called stabilized large ratios, and this then will uh, assume that F uh, has a lower intensity than C uh, because there are just uh, less peptides uh, identified, maybe because it's less abundant, right? So that's uh, stabilized large ratios. And this is essentially the basics of what uh, Max LFQ is doing in the background uh, when you use it. So uh, now I'm going to talk about some of the benchmarking that has been done for Max LFQ. So we, uh, we've done two uh, different kinds of benchmarking, one for small ratios and one for large ratios. And I will start with the small ratios. Here we have uh, two experiments. One in which HeLa and E. coli uh, samples uh, have been mixed one-to-one. -one. 
digested with trypsin and uh, have been fractionated with isoelectric uh, fractionation into 24 um, fractions and in three replicates. And in the other one, we just have three times as much as E. coli, right? So we have six samples, uh, and across the six samples, HeLa should stay the same, but in three of the samples, uh, E. coli should be three times more, right? Uh, and uh, here we have the results for that for three different methods. So one is spectral counting. This is where you count the number of MSMS uh, spectra. One is summed up intensities, where you just sum up the intensities of the peptides. And the third one is max LFQ. And as you can see, uh, summed up intensities is performing better than spectral counting. So there is a better uh, separation of the two populations, with orange being E. coli and uh, uh, the blue one being uh, human. And it's performing much better in, uh, in the, um, uh, with, for the peptides which are higher uh, there. And for max LFQ, uh, we can see that the, the, the separation is even better. And uh, this is basically the same plot as the one above. Uh, with just the intensity of the, uh, with the density of the uh, peptides. And this also uh, shows that uh, max LFQ is performing better in this case. Uh, again, this is the, uh, these graphs are showing the same data. I'm just showing you this to uh, emphasize the fact that uh, with, if these are log 2, so 2 to the power of 1.74 is uh, about 3.3, and it's much closer to the Uh, threefold increase that we were expecting from the uh, benchmarking. So uh, it's again, max LFQ on the far right is much better than the other algorithms. Um, uh, later, uh, there was uh, the, we wanted to know what kind of uh, testing we needed to, would be better to find the significant changes. And uh, Uh, as you can see here, T-test and Welsh T-test, Welsh modified T-test, uh, have the best uh, performance in this precision recall uh, uh, plot uh, in determining significant changes. We can do this because we already know that we expect E. coli to be more than human, right? Uh, and they perform better than just the ratio. And this is because that with, t with the T-test, you can take care of these um, uh, outliers. Um, there was one more uh, thing that was done for uh, benchmarking max LFQ, and that was to determine what is the limit of detection. So how small can the ratio be uh, for, uh, before the algorithm like, starts to uh, perform badly? And what was done was uh, Jürgen uh, in silico shifted the uh, density of the populations together in the other plots, if you th think about them. And then we, uh, we could find out that uh, anything above 1.5 uh, fold increase was, uh, could be detected quite uh, nicely. So that's um, another way of looking at it. Uh, for large ratios, what was done was, uh, again, uh, two sets of ex experiments with four replicates, single shot this time. Uh, with the UPS1 uh, and UPS2 samples from uh, Sigma, I think. Uh, UPS1 has uh, 48 human uh, proteins uh, in the same amount. Uh, these are recombinant proteins. And UPS2 has the same proteins in groups of, I think, eight... Um, groups of... Sorry, one second groups of, I think, eight and uh, increasing uh, fold by fold. And Max uh, LFQ was able to uh, uh, Max LFQ was able to detect these changes quite nicely. So you can see the E. coli proteins here on, on the zero and the protein groups being clustered together here as such. Um, So here, again, the three algorithms are uh, uh, compared. Uh, interestingly, and actually uh, expecting this, uh, spectral counting wasn't able to find the two lower abundant 
proteins because it is uh, relying on MS, MS spectra and low abundant uh, proteins are not being sequenced, but some intensities on MaxLFQ can, uh, can find these uh, lower abundant proteins quite nicely. And again, as you can see, there is a nice, um, there's nice performance there from MaxLFQ. Um, so this is the uh, MaxLFQ site in, within uh, MaxQuant for uh, protein label-free quantification. There's one more thing that you can do within uh, Perseus, and that is to uh, do some imputation to get uh, rid of the missing values so that you can have uh, proteins to compare your... Uh, you can have values to compare your uh, uh, protein intensities uh, to. Uh, and this is the way it is done is that um, usually the peptide uh, distribution within samples are, uh, follow these normal distributions. And if you, uh, what, what you can do in Perseus is you can basically simulate what the distribution will be on the far left of the graph. And then you can use uh, values uh, within the noise of the uh, detection for, uh, for the um, uh, quantification. And uh, in this paper here, they did some tests with this. And uh, as you can see here, we, we are not using match between runs. And we, the gray uh, dots are all the missing values within the matrix. With matching, you already fill a lot of these uh, gray uh, values here. But with uh, this kind of imputation, uh, you can also uh, fill much more of these uh, values there. So that's MaxLFQ. Now I would like to go, to, go on with uh, absolute quantification. Uh, the problem with absolute quantification is... Sorry, Hamid, do we have a question? Yep. Go back to here. Hello. I Hi. I have a bunch of small questions. Uh, do you report the normalization factor? Jürgen? Do you output? No. Oh, okay. No. So there's a normalization factor for each run. It's, it you, gets you don't implemented, that. but it's not reported. No. Second, what if, uh, what, what, how problematic would it be if you set the minimum count, ratio count, to be one? If you set the uh, ratio count to one, mm -hmm. you will have uh, more noisy data, right? So you will, uh, you will end up with more noise, but you will have less missing values. Uh, and if you set it higher, you have, you, you're, you're more confident in them. Right. So that's, that really depends on the kind of experiment you're doing, yeah. right? The last one is, I'm not sure, uh, how does a uh, stabilized large ratio uh, calculate? Uh, how, how does it work? I... So, the, uh, okay. Stabilized large ratio. Yeah, okay. So in this case, uh, what stabilized large ratios is uh, kind of um, doing is saying that since in sample C, we have many of the peptides, six out of seven, then probably some, uh, there is a large ratio difference with F because F only has two of them, right? So you can only identify two peptides for it. It's probably because F is lower abundant than uh, than C, and stabilized large ratios takes care of that, right? And then it uses summed intensities instead of, uh, instead of the max LFQ way. So max LFQ, in case of these large uh, ratios, utilizes summed up intensities. Any more? One more. Um, is there any way of distinguishing proteins that are legitimately not detected from those that just failed to apply the LFQ algorithm and it's reported as zero? So then you don't have an identification, right? Well, so in this, in this case for F, for example, we have an identification. Right, sorry, I'm, I'm like, so if you have two samples and the protein's in one and it's not in the other one, but then in another case you may have another protein that it's present in both, but one of them just didn't have the minimum ratio count, so LFQ reported a zero. You would see zero in both cases. Is there any way of distinguishing whether it's a true zero or whether it's a failed al algorithm application? 
is it both? Can can we have a mic for uh, Jürgen? In, in any case, one can never show that the protein is not present in the sample and might just be below the detection limit, right? So it's always a gray zone and compromise, and we just put the the, the, the decision level on, on a bit higher. If we say, okay, we want to have these two peptides, right, then just the threshold where you say, okay, we cannot detect it anymore, it's just somewhere different. But anyway, even if you set uh, stringent criteria here, I mean, information is still in the output tables. There's still the information that uh, one, peptide, <clears throat> one peptide might have been identified in the sample. I mean, this is not, not gone and there for you to look at, right? Does that, does that answer your question? Sorry, my, my phone was going crazy. Can you start again? <laughs> yeah, but this information is not gone. It's there, right? I mean, you can just look at that information. So what else? I mean, what would you suggest? What do you want to do? No, I mean, if if you I mean, if the, you, you can't say if the protein is not there, right? So, but that's also what uh, you get if you set ratio count to one. Then that's more or less what 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 you want, right? I mean, because then it would actually, and it's still a little bit different, but it would actually always report almost always report something if there is something, right? So, I think that that's probably what you want. Yeah, I think the. I think it's just two, two, two types of information, right? So one is uh, what do you want to report as a reliable quantification that goes in, you know, clustering and so on. The other is, uh, is there something detected, right? And so the question is, is it really a good idea to put these two numbers into one number? I don't know. That. Okay. So I think we're a little bit short on time, so I'm going to just quickly mention absolute uh, quantification. Um, yeah, so as uh, Dan talked about this morning, so MS is not inherently quantitative, and for absolute quantification, what we need is actually we need some sort of scale to uh, quantify the proteins within a sample. And for that, we have the proteomic ruler. Um, and for more information, you can go to this publication and for citations, of course. And this uh, is also being uh, adapted by uh, the community quite well. So what is a proteomic ruler? In essence, it is uh, adding a scale, and that scale is the histones. So um, the histone to DNA ratio uh, is known to be one. And if you know how, many, uh, how much histone you have, you know how much DNA you have. And by knowing how much DNA you have, you can essentially calculate how many cells you have. Because you know the ploidy of your sample, the cells in your sample, and you know how much DNA each of your cells have. And you can normalize that, uh, and you can then count the number of cells. And by using this, by using the histone signal, you can uh, do absolute quantification for all your other proteins. Uh, you need about, you need, your proton kind of needs to be as deep as about 13 to 14 or maybe 12 to 13,000 peptides to be able to do this and avoid serious biases. And uh, in the paper, you can read more because we're short on time right now, but. Uh, we have uh, compared uh, cell counting to DNA determination and histone proteomic uh, uh, ruler, and you can see that the results are quite uh, comparable. And here, uh, the proteomic ruler has been uh, compared to pressed SILAC method, which is quite precise, and you can see that, the, um, that the, uh, they kind of uh, have the same kind of performance. And if you have about uh, 20 peptides uh, for uh, your proteins, then the fold changes are also quite comparable. And with that, a van proteomic ruler is a plugin within Perseus, so that has, that's different from where you can use uh, MaxLFQ. And with that, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Jürgen and the group, and uh, thank you all for your attention.
Okay, we have time for just a few questions. Hello, thanks for the uh, explanations. Uh, question, is it also possible to impute on the peptide level? Since when you, somehow when you, when you summarize them to proteins, you assume missings are zero, so you already do kind of imputation. Is it also possible to impute on the peptide level already with a low range of the intensity distribution? No, I don't, I don't think so. So if I want to, uh, to do uh, absolute quantification, but I have a system like uh, skeletal muscle fiber, for example, and, and there are, uh, yeah, they contain hundreds of um, yeah. nuclei. So is it still possible to use the proteomics ruler? Or, or? That's a good question, actually. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, you have many nuclei within one cell, right? So you kind of have to somehow normalize for that. You have, to, you have to guess what the average number of nuclei per cell are and then normalize for that somehow. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hamid. Thank you.